Welcome into episode 300 of the Skate Podcast. I am Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Pru and Scott McLaughlin. We started this podcast at episode 42, and for, for quite a while, we were able to shout out a Bruin who had worn, worn the jury's number of whatever episode we were doing. We're a long, long ways away from that, Bridget and Scott, but it's been quite the quite the ride so far. Yeah, no, the the Bruins have not retired enough numbers to have to use 300 yet. 300, so. well, one day, one day in the future. Yeah, in the year like 2400. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we made it to 300, guys. That's I'm, when we started, we didn't even, we just took it over for fun, really, actually, when we started. So now we do it like, what, three, three times a week. Um, it's great. Yeah, it was, it was like, well, no one else is doing it, so I guess we'll start it back up and now what it's gonna be what's see i'm trying to think what see was that the 21 yeah it was Mm -hmm. uh it was right before the it was right before the trade deadline where they got taylor hall yeah yeah because uh it was the year they started the season in january and right yeah the the podcast was just inactive for about a calendar year or so and i i texted ken and i actually got the thumbs up and then here we go. And then I texted Scott and, and we got Bridget on and the rest is history. So anyway, but thanks everybody for listening, you know, since episode 42 and even before then, obviously, but um, obviously the three of us really enjoy doing this and, you know, obviously we'll, we'll, we'll talk bad about the Bruins here and there. We'll talk great about the Bruins, but it's just about, you know, it doesn't get any better than just talking about the team you grew up watching for fun. So we enjoy it and, and you guys make everything worthwhile. So, yeah, uh, and, and, yeah. and I'm I'm glad we got we got got a nice mailbag on the way today. Got a lot of questions. We are not going to be able to get to them all. So thanks to everyone who sent one in, or, or sent multiple questions in. Um, but yeah, guys, I, I I need this today because today is a today's not a good day. It was it was a rough night for my BU Terriers Thursday night. Ooh, and, and I was wondering floor, how soon. So. Yeah, this is this is exactly the the pick me up I need. So. Um, you know that's it's a good thing i guess less said about that game the the better um you know um, i could i could go on my rant about the officiating but it doesn't doesn't do any good at this point i wanted bcbu but uh yeah. i think everybody denver, did i didn't think denver was like i mean i have like a hockey east bias cuz i mean all of us are living where hockey east is way more readily available to to go attend or watch or in my case broadcast uh i thought that bu was a better team so i didn't think denver was gonna get by him but we don't have to talk about that we don't yeah i mean the the can's open now then denver made their push like late in the second period into the third um just listen it's just unbelievable that bu had zero power plays in that game that's all that's all i'm gonna say like now if you if you watch that game that was not a game where bu deserves zero power plays no, and but I mean, it, the further you go into playoffs, the less likely you're gonna have those kind of advantages. But Scott, do you think? Yeah, well, Macklin, Den- Denver got four, so they you know they had no true. problem. They had no problem giving Denver power plays. <laughs> do you think Macklin wins the Hobie tonight? Uh I think it's probably Gautier, but it's gonna be very close. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. I mean, late, late push for Macklin, I think. No, nah, well. And so the thing is, is like, it's not, it's not really an MVP award. If it was an MVP award, I think it'd be Celebrini. Cause I yeah. think he meant more to be you than, than any one player means to BC. That's not, it's not a knock on anyone in BC. It's just, they're an absolutely loaded team. Mm-hmm. And if you take one of the superstars away, they're still a loaded team. You take Celebrini away from BU, like they're screwed. They're not in the NCAA well, tournament. So I will, I will say what watching last night, the first period, certainly, um, and the first 10 minutes, BU was all over Denver. And it, and I was like, all right, it's looking like BU is going to do their part for the BU-BC National Championship, which, by the way, happened one time in, was it 78 or 76, 78? And 78, yeah. not many chances to have, to line up like it did this year to have it happen again. So it's, it's a missed opportunity just for, you know, in my opinion, college hockey to have that matchup. But BU came out so strong and – Celebrini was all over the place, and I was like, "Okay, BU is looking good here." Uh, and, and Scott, the the 
it, it's very frustrating because the referees definitely had that mentality of let's just put the whistles away and let the boys play, but they, but it seemed to really only be <laughs> regarding one yeah. team, and it, it it certainly wasn't great a great look for that. And you wonder how the game changes if BU gets one or two power plays simply because of their dynamic fo- um, forward and Macklin Celebrini. That said, and it also changes momentum. I will say. I thought from the second period through through overtime when they scored, I did think Denver was the better team. Having more power plays helps that. But BU's goaltender, both goaltenders, but BU's goaltender was outstanding robbery, larceny on at least two or three open nets for Denver where yeah. you kind of you, you look back at that game and, you, and it's frustrating because you want to be mad at the officials for just not calling it down the middle. And... Also feeling weird because Denver did carry the most of play, but you wonder if that was an effect of it. But in any event, BC did their job later in the night, and so we have BC versus Denver in the national championship tomorrow. So go Eagles. Brid- Bridget, you're muted. But yeah, I was gonna say in that the e- in the Eagles game, like the officiate there was I feel like there were they were more conscious to not do that in the in the Michigan BC game, but um yeah, once once BC get a few really lucky bounces for goals, but they're also just crazy good. Um, so I think we all thought that BC would be in the championship game and I had them as the winner. I think a lot of people do. Um, so, but I guess don't sleep on Denver, right, Scott? No, you, you can't. And, and I'll say this for Denver all season long. They were like this high flying team. They're the number one offense in the country, but they also gave up a lot of chances. All of a sudden, NCAA tournament comes and they're they've won all three of their games two to one. Like they've turned into this lockdown defensive team, um, and their and their goalie Davis, he's he he had like an awful first half, and mm-hmm. now he's been playing like one of the best goalies in the country the last yeah. couple months. And you know, I thought he was really good too. So you, you know, well, he took out UMass and then he took out BU. So Scott was laughing at me a few weeks ago, but. <laughs> One one last comment before we go to the, the the Bruins practice today and then mailbag. But in addition to BUBC no longer happening and just that incredible Boston rivalry and, and being on the national stage, it's also a missed opportunity, and you guys know me, in the uniform department because to see BC's crisp whites go up against BU's scarlet red is, is, is great. Now, I think Denver has some of the best uniforms in college hockey as well. It's just that you're contrasting – uh, B- BC's brown slash maroon and gold versus Denver's maroon slash brown and gold. It's the same color. So both yeah. great uniforms respectively, but the the lack of contrast now is like, uh, I was hoping for that that matchup with BU to wear their reds, but oh well. Yeah, it was it was all great jerseys uh, last night. Mm. Michigan's are, are classics too. So. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, Scott, you were at Warrior Ice Arena this morning. If you want to update listeners on the Bruins practice lines and and newsworthy items from that practice before the mailbag. Sure. So yeah, kind of several newsworthy items. Uh, Pat Maroon, as expected, practiced in full, uh, lined up on the fourth line with Jesper Bokvist and Jacob Lauko. Johnny Beecher got moved up to the third line with Morgan Geeky and Trent Frederick. Jake DeBrusque was back in the top six with Coyle and Marshand. Van Riemsdyk was was the extra forward, so it looks like he's not playing Saturday. Um, on defense, the one change was Shattenkirk is in for Weatherspoon. Montgomery confirmed that after practice, Shattenkirk will play Saturday. Um, he also got power play reps, so clearly, I think, you know, a move to bring a little more offense back into the lineup. Um Derek Forbert practiced for the first time since his most recent injury uh, and whatever he had, he had some sort of surgery or procedure, but it never got officially announced what it was. Um, but he was out there in a red, no contact Jersey. Montgomery said he's still a ways away. So I don't, I wouldn't expect to see him in, in a game anytime soon, but the fact that he is actually practicing is, you know, I, I don't think, anyone really expected that because it Don Sweeney had said that he was most likely done for the season. Um, and he might still be, but he's at least out there right now. 
And then the other development was Mason Lori left practice early. And Montgomery said after that they are considering sending him to Providence to get more game action. Obviously, he's kind of found himself out of the rotation on defense. So, you know, I think I would I would expect to see him back in Boston at some point if he is sent down. But clearly they want to get him some games here before you get to playoff hockey. There's a lot there. I mean, that's why we wanted to wait till record till after practice because we wanted to know what was going on with Maroon, um, how close he was. The Forbert stuff's, you know, unexpected. The Lorai stuff's unexpected. So, um, you know, it's, it's, and, and obviously JVR, we were wondering about too, where he would be, would he be in, would he be out? So, um, definitely a lot to update. It feels like I, I know one of the big conversations that we had had over the past few weeks in terms of, um, D pairs was should Laura come in and play with Carlo and and you know we had made comments and we had some some um, listeners uh, um, make comments about uh, whether or not it was more meta- beneficial for Laura to go down to Providence and because because we said he only had played two of the last eight games so um, at some point in time you do need to to let him get back and playing and uh, maybe it sounds like I, I Scott in, in just what I can gather from having him leave practice early. Uh, he's definitely not, not going to be, like, he's definitely going to Providence today. If you're what, what would be the point of leaving practice early? If it wasn't to go join Providence. Right. It, it, it certainly seems that way. So by the time we post this or some people listen to this, maybe there'll be a transaction already, but that's in my mind, that's you don't leave practice um, unless you're going somewhere immediately. So. Uh, sounds like he's in Providence uh, as of today, tonight, um, which is good. I mean, he needs more game time. And if if they're going to get Shattenkirk back in the lineup and they weren't going to put Laura back in the lineup, then he does need to play more. So I guess he'll have to go down to Providence. And like you said, come the start of the playoffs, I'm sure he'll be back with Boston. They're not, they don't need him for the P Bruins playoff run. Like they need him in Boston, so. Yeah, I mean, I think if if the options are sit on the ninth floor and not play or go to Providence and play, I'd rather him go to Providence and play. Um, I think where I sit, I would just rather than play in Boston. But again, it's an argument that apparently nobody agrees with me on, including the Bruins. So I'll just you know nip that one in the bud. But when when Grizzly gets exposed in the playoffs again, don't come knocking on my door. So uh, the forward lines. Um, yeah, the top line, no no issues here. Like that has to stay the way that it stays. Um, if there's, I mean, Van Riemsdyk, again, there's only so much you can really do when he hasn't performed. So he's outside the top 12. DeBrusque on that line with Marshan. Hopefully he gets DeBrusque going, Marshan as well. And then just some tinkering in the bottom six. Um, obviously, if Brazo comes back for the playoffs, I think it changes things if he's out. I think this is kind of what you're looking at, right? I mean, maybe Van Riemsdyk gets in for one of those guys in the bottom six, but no real surprises from where I sit. It's just kind of tinkering. and It's going gonna, it's gonna to be continued tinkering, I think. Well, the the part that, not that it's surprising because Beecher should be playing, but that he's moved to the third line, like Beecher, Geeky, Frederick, was not in my mind as, you know, right. it didn't come right to, to the front of my mind as, as a combination. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's clearly still just trying to find the answer there in that third line, which they haven't found yet. I I also wouldn't be surprised, you know, if Maroon looks good, like gets up to speed, if he gets a look there at some point. Um, you know, Ma- Maroon was pretty funny. We talked to him after practice, and he, he was pretty honest about, like, yeah, like, of course, my timing's probably going to be off. I haven't played in two months, he said. That's not what he said. He said, uh, I'm sure my timing is going to look like is going to be horse shit tomorrow. Yes, this that's is, what he said. This is exactly <laughs> So, um, yeah, and then he was asked, like, you know, if you only play, like, two of these last three games, because obviously the last two are back-to-back, is that enough to be ready for playoffs? And he was like, I, I don't know. It's going to have to be. <laughs> like, the, there's no other option, so you got to do your best. Um it is tough, especially starting with a new team. Like, but you know, um, he does also, I think, benefit from playing a 
very simple, straightforward game. So, you know, it's not, it's not like he's learning. Um, he doesn't have to learn like as many ins and outs as a skill player coming here is going to be making a lot of creative plays and trying to figure out, okay, where are my teammates going to be open and how do they play off me? Like Maroon style is pretty straightforward meat and potatoes. So once that timing is back, like it, it shouldn't be too much of a ramp up. And before we move on to the mailbag, Scott, was there any update on Brezzo? Uh, there has not been any update on Brezzo. We we've seen him skating before practices, uh, but he has not rejoined them for practice. Hmm. Plus Scott, is not allowed to ask about Brazo because I'm pretty sure last week Montgomery was asked about Brazo when he said week to week and don't ask me next week. That, yeah, that, that was on Monday. So we still have another week before we can ask him again. Is that really how journalism works now? <laughs> Is that how it works? Like, yeah. you just don't ask because you said don't ask. Right. Yeah. I don't know if that's how it usually is supposed to work. And Uh, then as as far as Shattenkirk getting into the lineup over Watherspoon, at at least in these practice, I I think it's probably just a matter of getting everybody reps before playoffs. So I don't read into that one too much. Not that I would be completely surprised if Shattenkirk was in your game one lineup, but I just think it's keeping him fresh. Uh, He's been out a few games here. So, yeah. And if you, and like Scott said, trying to take power play reps because we're, we're at a point where, they need to figure out how to score on the power play. And if that means having a different facilitator on your first or your second unit and using Shattenkirk there and you, and you can, you know, use, use that to try to spark the power play, then go for it. Um, Definitely worth a shot. And and speaking of which, Scott, forgive me. Did you mention earlier the power play lineups that were in practice as well? Because there was a notable change up front on the power play one. Uh, I did not, but yeah. So to, with Van Reems like drawn out of the lineup, obviously that means he's also off power play one. So DeBrusque was net front on the top unit, still with Pasenak, Zaka, Marshan, McAvoy. And then the second unit, as Bridger mentioned, Shattenkirk was running the point. Uh, Geeky Coil Heinen as three across, and Pat Maroon was getting net front time on, in practice. So um, looks like they're going to give that a shot. Yeah, I'd like to see it. I want to see it in Pittsburgh. I want to see it this week at some point. So and Pittsburgh's playing for their lives. Yeah, they 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 are currently wild card two, leapfrogging Detroit with a very exciting win in overtime. So Pittsburgh's going to come and they're going to bring it because it's Pittsburgh, it's it's Washington, it's Detroit and Philly. They are all right there with you know three games left in the season. I yeah. think they're all within a point or two of each other. So yeah. Pittsburgh's going to bring their A game. Kind, kind of crazy that the the Islanders have actually gotten a little bit of separation for the third spot in the Atlantic. Mm. So they they could very well make it. And then, yeah, all those other teams battling for, for the wild card. It's, I can't believe Pittsburgh made up that ground. Well, I can because everyone else sucks. Everyone else kept losing. Yeah, no, like, but I mean, like, I mean, just like purely numbers wise. Right. It, yeah. It was a lot. Well, and, and just, you know, from like a how it looked thing, like after that Gensel trade, that team just looked dead in the water. Like mm-hmm. that was like a team that was just, just rolled over for a couple games. Like, uh, and, you know, I, I guess well, obviously. They were pissed. Yeah. And, and I don't think Getzel was particularly happy to be traded either. I mean, I'm sure he likes the team now, but he he didn't – he made it clear he didn't really want to leave Pittsburgh. But, um, but yeah, it's it's one – once again, we're talking about Washington being sellers and Pittsburgh being sellers, and one of them is probably making the playoffs. So, um, crazy. Mm-hmm. So, let's get to the mailbag because we have got a lot of questions. So, we want to try to get to as many as possible. So, I'm just going to put this up um, real quick. Just so you know, uh, we'll definitely do one in between end of regular season and uh, playoffs as well, right, guys? Because we will have a little bit of time off between Tuesday. Is Tuesday the last regular season game against Ottawa? Yeah. And then probably they don't play again until either Saturday or Sunday, right? Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, once the end of the regular season comes, send us more. But let's get to the questions that we got today. And I want to start with... Some goalie questions, um, because we got a lot of those regarding Swayman, Allmark, how to use them. So I want to start with an email we got from Chip. He said, um, playoffs are going to be huge for Swayman. Can you see him getting over $7.5 million as part 
as a part-time goalie with average puck handling skills? What is another f- first round exit with two or three losses? And uh, you can't keep $12 million in goalie salaries next year. So basically Chip saying Swayman needs to have a great postseason in order to get the contract that he wants. And we had this conversation with Razor on Sunday skate. Like, can you even keep that in the back of your mind? Razor thinks that, of course, it's, it's on Swayman's mind that he needs to win the job to get the next contract. I don't know. What do you guys think about how Swayman has to play in order to get a deal done with Boston that he's happy with. Yeah. I mean, I think whatever happens between now and the end of their playoff run, whenever that is, is going to have a huge impact on what Swayman's next contract looks like. Like it can go so many different ways. You know, he, he can play a bunch and, and win and all of a sudden his value goes up. He can play, you know, half the games and not be very good. And his value goes down. If he loses the job to Elmark, obviously that doesn't help. Like there, yeah, there's a lot on the line for him. Obviously, first and foremost, just trying to win games. But yeah, the, the contract's part of it too. And to answer the question specifically about the numbers, right now, no, I I cannot see myself giving Swayman seven and a half million a year. I don't that is like elite top, that's like elite top, you know five, six goalie in the NHL money. And I don't being completely honest, like I don't really know what he's done to earn that just yet. I mean, he made, made the all-star game this year, but obviously hasn't has been inconsistent since then. So um, yeah, a lot on the line for him. I feel like he would also rather have like a slightly lower annual value, but have a longer term contract. Like to, to me, it feels like he values having the, the stability of like a longer term contract. I don't think he's going to push for something crazy. Uh, like, like that number, like seven and a half. I just don't think that, I think he's more well, realistic than that. Yeah. I mean, but if he, it like, if he doesn't earn a bigger money contract, I, I don't think he would want to go long term. I think he'd want to go short term and try to, you know, become the number one star type goalie in the next few years and then cash in again in his late 20s. It's not a bad – yeah, that's not a bad way to put it either. I just know that stress-wise, like, it, it affected him in the summer, um, having to go through contract negotiations, like, over and over and over again isn't fun. Uh, and, and you constantly have people telling you you're worth less than you think you are, and it it, it wasn't a fun process for him. So um, certainly that factors into how often he wants to keep negotiating contracts. I, I think there's a couple of factors. Number one, the whole Bruins goalie rotation, goalie platoon has led to a tremendous, tremendous team success. But where it does hurt Swayman is at the negotiation table. Uh, you want, as Scott put it, like elite number one money. Well, because of the way that they've utilized Swayman and Allmark, nobody knows if Swayman can carry, can be worth that dollar amount uh at, for the majority of a season as a true number one, because even though the league now has gone away from the number one starter getting like 65 games or whatever, there's most teams aren't doing a straight up split like the Bruins are doing. And another factor that would lead to Swayman having complete control of the net would be, do the Bruins try to move Lena Selmark in the off season uh, as a trade piece, the the cap is going up. The Bruins have twenty million dollars in cap space, so they might not have to trade him specifically. But um, there's a lot of factors at play, and so and and if Allmark does stay, you really want Swayman gets seven point five. You're going to be spending twelve and a half million dollars in net. I don't think so. So yeah, I don't, all signs point to no matter what. I don't think he's getting that that amount of money and. To Scott's point, he hasn't shown anything that tells us he deserves it, aside from putting up really good numbers, but not elite, in a 50-50 goalie rotation for a couple mm-hmm. of years. And that's that's great. He's playing well throughout that, but you know, it's it's you can't have your cake and eat it too. Like everybody says how great the goalie rotation is, and that's true. But as it pertains to an individual trying to find a next contract, it it definitely has a it has its downside to that if you're Jeremy Swayman because of this rotation, nobody knows what you can do when the net's your, your own. So, 
There's an interesting part too to this question by Chip as well, uh, because I hadn't thought of this, so I'll I'll read it. It says, "Have any NHL teams used a playoff goalie tandem where one plays only home games and the other only road games?" Uh, he said, "I asked tongue in cheek, hoping maybe." we could talk to Razor about it on Sunday skate uh, because, you know, Razor hates the goalie tandem. <laughs> he doesn't, I should say, he doesn't hate the goalie tandem in the regular season. He hates the goalie tandem playoff idea of rotating. Uh, so, and I, I think that this question comes out of the fact that uh, so I, in the past, Swayman has played better at home, you know, right now, this year, Swayman has a, our, what's Swayman's road uh, record? Because there, I mean, there's there's a difference between how some of these guys play in TD Garden versus how they play, say, in Carolina or in in this case where it looks like they'll be playing Tampa, like how they play in Tampa or how they play in Toronto. Um, so <laughs> I think that this is probably out of the realm of of like a logic, like a a path that you would plan to go down where you're like, okay, yeah, Swayman gets all the home games. Olmark gets all the road games. Cause that, that really is like a goalie rotation or goalie rotation with no flexibility, right? Like if you're just like this one, that one, you guys get TD garden, you guys get Toronto or we're at Tampa or whatever. Yeah. The, the, the Bruins aren't doing that. And as Chip put it, there was tongue in cheek anyways, but one situation where there is something along these lines that's very interesting is in Carolina. Frederick Anderson has been awesome since he came back from like a very serious health scare, like life threatening health scare, but he has only played home games. He has not traveled with the team yet. So that is going to be extremely interesting to watch what Carolina does there. Like, does he, does he have clearance to travel for the playoffs or are they going to only play him in home games? Do they, go with Pyotr Kachekov as there? Do they just ride him because he can play home and road? Like, So not particularly interesting to me from a Bruins perspective because, you know, that they're not going to do it that way. But I am fascinated by that Carolina situation. And that's like a <laughs> – that has obviously ser- like a serious reason behind it. And it's not record-wise. It's – some, sometimes you have health issues where you need to be near your doctor at all times or you, you know, you, you can't go, uh, you can't travel like that. So that'd be interesting to see. You're right, Scott. Um, we have another goalie question here from Duncan, who sent us an email this week. He said, uh, he's trying to figure out his opinion on what the Bruins should do with a goalie rotation and that it's so polarizing that it feels like you either have to be one or the other and you can't really be an in-between of you either really want it or you don't want it at all. Uh, so he says, I he thinks you should start Swayman game one um, to find out what Swayman looks like in a high-pressure situation to give him it to start the series to see if he can win the job, basically. Um, and then ride the hot hand if if Swayman like, loses the chance or um, there's a need to bring Olmark in and just – see who's hot after that point basically is what chip was saying so do you guys think that swayman right what this was duncan yes duncan do you guys think that you give swayman a chance to start game one (laughs) duncan there you go brian um spelt like that too no no it's spelt with a c not not like that um so not of not of the the famous duncan family that (laughs) courtney cox thought was uh (laughs) <laughs> Duncan was named after. Yeah, no. Um, no, not spelled like that. Sorry. Uh, do you think that it's reasonable to think, hey, let's let's start Swaim in game one and see if he runs with it? Well, Scott, I know you had an opinion uh, against it, so. Yeah, like I get where the question comes from because Swayman has not started game one of a playoff series yet. He has always gone into the playoffs as the number two. Um, But to me, you got to earn the game one start. And I don't know what the argument right now would be for Swayman having earned that over Allmark. Like, Allmark's been better for two months now. We're not talking about, you know, a few games or a couple weeks. It's been 
two months since the All-Star break that Allmark has, in my mind, pretty clearly outperformed Swayman. So I, I'm like, I'm not giving Swayman the game one star just because, hey, we haven't done this before, so let's give it a shot. No, I'm playing whichever goalie I think is playing better right now. So, I mean, so what does ride the hot hand mean? Anytime somebody loses, next guy goes in. I mean, so if, if Allmark starts game one and wins, say say he wins two, three games in a row, then loses, then Swayman, then Swayman loses back. Anytime a guy loses, put the other guy in. <laughs> I, I guess. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't mind that, I suppose. If, I mean, if we have equal faith in all these guys, one guy loses, next guy goes in. Next guy loses, next guy goes in. Yeah. If, if it's a loss, like, on a genuinely, like, poor performance or like mediocre performance then yes then right if it's a loss yeah. where you, you 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 see a good performance from goaltending and there was lack it was lacking other places anyway we talk a lot about goalies so we're gonna switch subjects and this one caught my eye just now so frank sent us this email and the first thing he said was first i have to say i'm team pumba so scott we're getting you Pumba. Love that. <laughs> I think we're all team Pumba. We're all team Pumba. Honestly, I would start Pumba game one. I like he <laughs> takes up a lot of room in the net. You know, he's a little short, a little low, but definitely battles on rebounds. Yeah, I still gotta I gotta check my uh HOA rules on that. I I know we are allowed to have pets, but I don't know if warthogs uh are covered. He said he wanted a cat, but like would you settle for a mere cat and a warthog? <laughs> Love that. <laughs> so anyway, I I tweeted it on the skate pod. I tweeted a picture of of Pumba. Um, if you didn't listen to last podcast, basically I was trying to find Scott a, a kitten to adopt, and the first thing that popped up on the MSPCA was a warthog. So <laughs> that's how we we found out about Pumba, and now we are all very invested in what happens to Pumba and how he lives in Scott's apartment. <laughs> um, anyway, Scott, no one sent you any kittens this week, by the way. Uh, nope, not yet. Okay, that was no, like the goal. No one sent me, was... By the way, no one sent me Bruce Springsteen tickets either. I got I got oh. desperate enough to to tweet about getting tickets for uh, his Friday night show in Connecticut, and I have not 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 had any luck there. So well, it is Friday, so I'm sorry to tell you, I don't think you get the tickets. Can, can I can I just say real quick? By the way, if it's not Scott, if any one of our listeners end up adopting Pumba because Bridget brought up Pumba on a podcast that would be the most heartwarming thing I could probably imagine that would be amazing if somebody actually adopted Pumba yes I don't, and I don't know if Pumba can fit in, in in my current space but maybe somebody else yeah I was gonna say we we gotta have listeners actually I know like we definitely have listeners who have actual farms like so someone someone can fit them in yeah, yeah. I should have linked the website. It was the same. It's the same website. If you go to the Bruins page where they had the dogs that were available to adopt from, you know, they they had at the last game. The guys were walking in with these puppies. I went to that website and the first thing I saw was two chickens and Pumba. So anyway, hashtag still, adopt Pumba. <laughs> second episode in a row where Pumba has derailed the hockey conversation. <laughs> Oh, let's get to Frank's question. Uh, he says, I'm extremely excited to see Pat Maroon, how he looks with the team. I'm just curious how you feel, uh, who should sit, and, uh, you know, what happens if Brazo comes back. Also, how has he looked during practices, which, Scott, you got to a little bit. Um, I can't imagine he's lost too much over the course of a year or two. Basically, like, is Maroon still – the Pat Maroon we remember uh, when he played against the Bruins and and when he's played, when he's been playing Stanley Cup winning hockey. Yeah, I mean, maybe not quite. Like, I'm sure he's lost a little bit, but his game was never really based on speed anyways, so you're not too worried about that. Like, I think at the very least, as long as he's healthy, he can bring – you know, that, that fourth line grittiness, hard work down low physicality um, for checking, like he should still be able to do all that, but you got to make sure, you know, he is actually healthy. Again, we're talking about back surgery. We're talking about the guy who has missed two months of games now. Um, I'm sure set, you know, as he said, his time will probably be horseshit Saturday night in Pittsburgh. So um, it's not, a, a it's not much of a ramp up period. But he's definitely going to get every opportunity to play because you didn't go trade for him for him to sit on the bench. So, um, yeah, 
as for who comes out right now, it's James Van Riemsdyk. We'll see if that sticks. Obviously, you, you know, Jacob Lauko is a candidate to come out at some point. Um, I think he played his way in last game. I think he was, you know, he brought good energy, physicality. But yeah, I've, you know, certainly when Brezzo comes back, I could see Lauko also coming out of the lineup. But again, we don't know when that's going to be. He's not practicing yet. Yeah, I echo what Scott just said. Uh, with Brazo out, it's between JVR and Loco, right? Which guy gives you the best chance to be that 12th forward on a given night? Brazo comes back in. Yeah, I think Loco and JVR are both, though, unless, you know, JVR finds his way in or whatnot, or Loco for one reason or the other. So, um, yeah. And Bra- so the next two games are road games as well. So if Brazo doesn't travel, then that leaves really only one regular season game for him to get back in, which would be Ottawa. But at the at this point, it kind of looks like the regular season is kind of foregone for him. Like it's more of a playoff, like when and if he gets in in the first round of the playoffs. And as you mentioned, that that the playoffs begin about a week after the regular season as well. So there is time I think for him Saturday, to Saturday too. Saturday and Sunday are the first playoff game. So, yeah, sat Saturday, April twentieth. Yep. So, by the uh, way, so I, uh, I believe Mason Laura just got officially sent down. So, okay. No, well, no, 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 no. The podcast hasn't ended yet. Oh, that's, that's weird. True. But we did already talk about it, so I guess that's all we needed to do. About fifteen minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's and that's really how long it usually takes. Um, yeah. But hey, good job, Scott. You caught that before we signed off. <laughs> um, so Frank, thank you for the question. He says he's from Boston, but he's been living in Miami, and he's got his fire department watching the Bruins games. So good for you, spreading the word, <laughs> making some more some Bruins fans down there. Uh, and there's one question in here that he has for Razor, so I'll save that for Sunday skate. I have my own list of questions that I save for Razor throughout the week as well <laughs> that I try to I just try to hit him with at some point during. Did you during guys? I was, I was listening on my drive in, but um, did you hear him Razor with Fourier this morning? Yeah, no, so. I didn't. But I I always go back and listen to that before we go on on Sundays. Yeah, so it, Gresh is out today um, on Friday, so. Fourier was doing one of his uh, jock itch shows where yep. he brings in Razor, he brings in Lou Maloney, Andy Hart was in for a little bit. Um, but he was he was asking Razor about uh, his playoff milkshake. And I think the, the idea was like, what are the ingredients that go into being a cup contender? But the way he asked it was just like <laughs> so convoluted. And like, not, well, I'm going to have to grab clear. that audio. Yeah. It was like not clear at all. And Razor's just like, what the hell do you mean? <laughs> I don't blame him. I don't blame him. That's, that's quite the way to ask that question. Those two, those two are not afraid to try to make the other one look stupid. That's yeah. what I can say. Uh, all right. So let us get to some of the other. I, I, I want to like jump because those are all emails and thank you guys for sending sending emails. I'm going to get to more, but I, I want to stick with uh, the maroon topic real quick. So we had a comment on Twitter from Mathman. He said, bring maroon in to replace Laukel, Olmark, Ingol, Shattenkirk in for Wotherspoon, which the Shattenkirk for Wotherspoon thing we think is going to happen for Pittsburgh, but we don't think that – we're not sh- sure what, that that's really going to stick for the playoffs. But Maroon in for Lauko was what he thought to do rather than Van Riemsdyk. Yeah, and, I mean, it might end up that way, as you know, as Brian said. like it's, It certainly seems like it's Lauko versus Van Riemsdyk for a spot, um, as long as Maroon is, you know, healthy and good to go and, and – relatively up to speed so obviously that they bring different things like it's not like those are two like for like players so that's interesting you know some of it could be matchup dependent i you know james van reams like when he's on his game should have a spot in the lineup like the jvr we saw for the first i don't know three and a half four months of the season is playing every night Unfortunately, it's just been too long since you've seen that JVR. Well, Patrick Maroon, now that I think about it, 
Patrick Maroon is not the threat to JVR. And in my opinion, neither is, is Loco. I think the emergence of Justin Brazo and, and, and right now Brazo's out and JVR is still out of the lineup. So I can see why it seems like Loco is the direct competition and even Maroon maybe. But James Van Riemsdyk is supposed to be a guy with, with size and puck protection ability who can score in tight around the net. Well, that's exactly what Justin Brazo is, is bringing to the table. Uh, at, at, he's even bigger than Van Riemsdyk, and he's at a younger point in his career than Van Riemsdyk. So, you know, I think Brazo has brought elements that JVR is brought for much of the season, but not so much the last quarter. And I think that what's probably going to happen is that Patrick Maroon is going to come into the lineup and I don't think he's going to leave because unless he just physically can't perform because they're not asking him to do anything that he's not capable of doing. They're asking him to be responsible defensively, stand up for his teammates, you know, in scrums if need be and be able to bring a veteran presence and some energy. And I don't and think apparently he's gonna, maybe net front on the power play. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, but I don't, and again, if Brazo comes back, then he, he, he might go back there. But I don't think my, – my point with Maroon is I don't think that the ask of him is so astronomical that he can't do it. So I think what's going to happen is Maroon's going to go into the lineup. He's probably not going to leave it. And then whether it's for game one or maybe game three or four, wh- whenever Brazo comes back in, he'll probably go back into the lineup alongside Maroon, not in the same line, but in the same lineup. And then – like I said, Lauko and Van Riemsdyk might be on the outside looking in unless somebody else um, isn't playing well. So I think what's going to happen is eventually you'll see Maroon and Brazo in the lineup and probably Lauko and JVR outside of it. Yeah. Eventually. Whenever Brazo comes back. I think it's, to me, the surprising thing is the way that Beecher came up and didn't go back down. Mm -hmm. So like Beecher has held on to his spot and we know among some of the reasons is his ability to win face-offs and spend time on the penalty kill. Um, so he is someone that actually really impeded on JVR's yeah. potential to get into the lineup because that's an extra body that wasn't on the team uh, a month or was it a month? It's over a month now, I think. Um, but anyway, that's, that's a spot that's no longer, or that's, that's a contested spot now rather than maybe JVR would have just, because if you look at where Beecher is in the lineup that Scott said from practice, he's playing left wing on the third line. That is where JVR had been playing. Mm. So um, Beecher actually ends up kind of being the guy that takes that spot. Um, and and Maroon, not really necessarily the direct competition, like you said. This one I was going to save to the end, but since we're talking about Pat Maroon, <laughs> this is a comment we got on YouTube. <laughs> There were some interesting comments about me on YouTube. I only grabbed one. Uh, (laughs) So uh, here, this one was my favorite that I found. It's uh, written, I assume, sarcastically from Bruins fan 8278. It said, you had to know Bridget was going to mention Pat Maroon on the ninth floor again. Highlight of her life. Yay, Bridget. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. That is kind of funny. Listen, it's the little things that make me happy. All right. On the ninth floor, I have a lot of fun, right, Scott? Uh, I like Too I much. like chatting people. Yeah, I do. I like chatting people up at the coffee machine. I like singing That's What Makes You Beautiful to Scott every time it comes on. Uh, you're really going to have to take that up with the, the TD Garden DJ because I will sing it every time. In the last game, he didn't see me coming. He thought he got away yeah, with it because I wasn't next to him, and I snuck up behind him. And I start singing in his ear, but uh, yeah, I just have a in lot Maroon's of ear or Scott's ear. <laughs> I don't think I could get anywhere near Maroon's ear. Uh, I'm a, a little, little stepladder. I would step need ladder. to get on Scott's shoulders to do that. Yeah. Um, but yes, big time. <laughs> Maroon turns around, challenges you to a fight. He's like, "I need some practice. <laughs> Haven't had it go in a while." Yeah. See, he's actually he's actually a nice dude from my conversations with him that are apparently the highlight of my life. So anyway, thank you for the comment. Uh, that one That's was fun. Funny. That is funny. Yeah. Next, maybe the third time you see him, the topic of the conversation will be, hey, Pat, have you met my new pet Pumba? Yeah. Maybe he's looking for it to adopt. Maybe. maybe. A Pumba. Maybe. All right. So that was a lot about Maroon. Let's see 
where do we want to go from here, guys? Is there any any specific topic you want me to look for? Um, because we, like I said, we got a lot of questions, and maybe, uh, maybe like some of the forward looking ones, like towards the off season. Oh, um, okay. Um, we did get Whether some Cam, Cam or Sam. I think Sam. Both had I was some questions well, along those lines. Well, Noah Hannif is off the table. True. Yeah. Okay, we'll start there. Kim Kim emailed us. She said, and this is before the Hannafin stuff came down. So it said, assuming that the Bruins don't re-sign Grizzlick and Forbert, do you think they still try to sign Hannafin? Oh, uh, if he does become a UFA, which we know he's not. Uh, like, I guess we could say, or a similar kind of player. Uh, and then this was these were the pairings that she liked for the playoffs or no for for next year starting next year um Linho McAvoy Lori Carlo Weatherspoon Peak because then in that case like she said if you don't sign Grizzly and Forbert that's kind of what it's lining up to be for your your pairings next year yeah and uh, obviously Kim sent that in before the Hannafin extension which came down on Thursday um so yeah, so if anyone missed it, Noah Hannafin is staying in Vegas. He signed a long-term extension there. Um, I think the AV was what it was like seven and a half or something like that. I, I don't have it exactly in front of me, but anyways, um, yeah, so he's off the market. I, I do I feel like the Bruins would have poked around there, but it kind of comes down to like how much do you believe in Lorai? Because if you think he's gonna be ready to be a top four defenseman next year, then you're probably not in the market for Noah Hannafin. Um, and Wotherspoon obviously has shown he can play more regularly. That Listen, they're going to – they'll bring in someone on defense, whether it's a – you know, whether it's a big swing for a top four guy or just someone to kind of round out your seven guys that you're going to roll with most of the year. Um, they'll do something. So I – for, as of right now, I would lean towards them not re-signing Grizzly or Forbert. I think they probably move in a different direction um, away from both of those guys. But I guess we'll see. I, you know, I don't know if one of them comes super cheap. Do you, do you entertain bringing them back? I, I guess it's possible. Yeah, and here are the numbers too. So Hannafin extended for eight years. Uh, $58.8 million contract and it's a uh, 7.35 per year. And you got to think like I, the Bruins had cap trouble this year. They're, they're not going to have as bad a situation next year, but that's still a big chunk of your cap. And you think about how it would be tied up on defense. A lot of your money would like that. That's a good chunk of money on defense. If you're paying for him, McAvoy, Lynn home. And then obviously Laura isn't under a huge contract. Um, And what peak, middle of the line, Weatherspoon, you know, good value, I guess you could say for his contract. So um, Hannafin off, off the table. But, but if you look at the pairs that, that she said, which is what it, it looks like it could be. I like those six, right? We like that. We like those yeah. pairs. That I like them so much. Those are my playoff pairs. <laughs> yes. If, if I were making the lines, I've, I've already, those are literally the playoff pairs that I would, I would do. Um, you know, something also regarding the Bruins offseason I've seen online is is people talking about DeBrusque and whether or not what the number would be to resign him at. And I see people saying that, like, if the number is $6 million at, that they should bring him back because you're not going to find people for what he does at less. And, and I hear that. I read that. I see that. And I think to myself, that's just that's just not true because literally the Boston Bruins this year – and Don Sweeney has shown you that's not true. I mean, literally, uh, uh, Heinen and Geeky and um, like JVR and all all these other guys, like like they've they've all brought incredible Boquist. They've all brought incredible like like value, and and value is the key term because they're all making far less than what six million would be. And so, like I, when people say, "Oh, DeBrusque is inconsistent," but you know what? You're not going to get what he brings to the table for any less than six million. I, 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 I bite back at that and I say, yeah, have well, you watched Morgan the Geeky stats. Morgan Geeky stats are almost exactly the same as Jake DeBrus. Right, one and, point less. Yeah, and how many games? So, like, 
Geeky's played 73 games. DeBrus has played 77. So yeah. his points per game are higher, yeah. as is Danton Heinen. Danton Heinen has four less points than DeBrusque in eight less games. So that actually might be pretty similar. But yeah. but spare me the whole DeBrusque is inconsistent, but you're not going to get you know better value for what he br- – that's not true at all. Have you seen the Boston Bruins this year? Don Sweeney literally has played money ball all year. So you can definitely get better value for DeBrusque if he's asking for – you know, I would have given yeah. him six, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, I think I think it would be hard to give DeBrus six million after after this season, and and like unless he just goes on an absolute tear in the playoffs and and helps you win, you know, at least a round, maybe multiple rounds. But you know, if you, the, the other part of it is like, if you if you don't spend five or six million on DeBrus, you can throw that towards maybe a, a more surefire wing scoring winger. Um, you know, obviously the big, big prize is going to be Sam Reinhardt. I kind of doubt they're a player there because he's he's probably going to come in at like 10 plus a year after the season he's had. Um, but Jake Gensel could also be out there. I think everyone, everyone kind of assumes he's just going to go back to Pittsburgh. But like, I, I don't think you can assume that, right? Like someone else could swoop in for him. Um, but there's, there's some others like even kind of, Lower than that, obviously, you know, Elias Lindholm is going to be a free agent. And that, I, I still think the Bruins are going to explore that, even though obviously he hasn't, you know, he still hasn't been great in Vancouver and he did just miss a little bit of time with an injury. Um, but maybe that lowers his value and makes him more signable. So you you can use that money elsewhere and it doesn't have to be a straight comparison of like, well, okay, do you want six, DeBrus for $6 million or so-and-so for $6 million? It can be, you know, if you don't spend $6 million on DeBrus, can you spend $8 million on someone more impactful? So um, there's lots of different ways to look at it. I'm not – I'm certainly not opposed to re-signing DeBrus, but for me at this point, it would have to come at, like, something of a, of a team – something of a discount, right? Like, if he's – he just hasn't had a good enough season to push for – like a legitimate tried and true top six money in my opinion. I yeah. mean some somebody who's been pushed aside in Vegas is Chandler Stevenson. And I think he's a free agent this 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 season. And then it's like I mean, he's a guy I would take in a heartbeat over over DeBrusque if you were to pay somebody else. So there's options out there, Bridget. You were about to say something. Yeah. So basically, you you guys kind of covered one of Kim's other questions, which was like, he's not worth six. Like he's maybe worth three or four. Um, but since we pretty much talked about what she was getting at anyway, I want to go to well, one email. one thing quick. Since Brian mentioned Vegas, that another one of those top wingers, Jonathan Marcheseau, because Vegas now is going to have their own cap issues, especially after yeah. this. Can if an extension. So as much as you sit here and you're like, oh, Vegas wouldn't let March or so the con Smythe winner go. It's like, well, what if they just don't have the money to keep them? Yeah. Because that's in play. I mean, that'd be huge for for anyone to get March or so. But um, yeah, I mean, this that'll be a topic of conversation for our off-season podcast, more so than now. Um, because we'll have plenty of time to go through and speculate. Um <laughs> So I want to get to. Yeah. Sorry, Brian, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say I can't. I can't wait till Jake DeBrusque is a 17 goal scorer for for the Jet for the Winnipeg Jets, and not in Boston. Honestly, like he's gonna have to score like honestly probably 15 points on a deep playoff run for me to even entertain him coming back. Like he's just literally see you later. Like, I, and I'm so rooting for the player because he's in Boston. We have the playoffs to come, but I'm so. I'm I'm tired of the player and people defending he all he does all the little get get out of here seriously go go play for Columbus I'm done okay sorry okay, next wow. question that 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 was a very definitive way to end the conversation about Jake Jake DeBrus. um oh, so man. uh Sam sent us an email she said why is everyone so concerned about the starting lineup for the playoffs when we know Monty will continue to change the lines uh, as he has all season I wish. He would be like other coaches and lock lineups in uh, and make changes only if someone gets hurt. But that's, I just don't see him changing his MO. And so her real question, 
doesn't have to do with playoff lineups or anything like that. She said, I know this is asking for pure conjuncture on your parts, but what do you think the lines will look like next year? Could you see Zaka moving back to wing? What do they do about the log jam in the bottom of the lineup? None of these guys are UFAs, Beecher, Brezzo, Boquist, and Lauco. Uh, and assuming his recovery goes well and he's able to train over the summer, could Pacha be the 2C or does he stay at 3C? Well, it's tough because I just you just don't know <laughs> the free agency aspect and the trade aspect. So, Scott, based on who we know is under contract next year and who's free agents, you can maybe give a best guesstimate. Yeah, I mean, look, there's going to be at least one, if not multiple, outside additions. Like, I think, I think Don Sweeney knows this team is, you know, at least one top nine forward short. Um, and that's, you know, look, Danton Heinen's a free agent, so can you bring him back cheap, keep him in the mix? But you you need another impact score, so someone from the outside is going to shake it up and. If it is a center, whether that's Elias Lindholm or someone else, yeah, that that definitely could bump Zach out of the wing. Um, Patra, I feel like, I feel like most likely probably lines up as the three C to start, but obviously you, you hope he makes a push and um, shows that he can play higher than that. But you're, I, I think that would be a lot to ask of him going into next year being like, okay, we're moving Zaka back to the wing and Patra, you're one of the top two centers, you know, especially coming off an injury. Like I'd still rather see him start on the third line and let him work his way up from there if he's ready to. But remember, this was a conversation that we were having a lot more in the beginning of the season where there were definitely times where we, we said, no, he's, he should be two C just because of how he, his skill set slotted in and the players around him. Um, it made more sense to have them on a skilled line than a grinding line. And, you know, um, it will be a topic of conversation again for us next year with the personnel. And uh, Zaka has played almost exclusively at center this season. Obviously, here and there, uh, earlier in the year, he was moved around. But uh, he's done a good job at center. I know uh, it's hard to find where where does Patra fit exactly because – we haven't had a full season to to see him play and and haven't been able to see him in different combinations and he, and he had a he had an interesting season and it wasn't the easiest thing for him even before the injury because he went to juniors he was kind of being jerked around a little bit um so next year really i guess is when we'll see where patra really fits um in the lineup i uh, so, guys, did you have anything more to say about about that question about, um, you know, what what could happen next year? Because I feel like we might be a little bit far out on those. Yeah, it, I mean, there's the, there's just too many unknowns. I, I I will say, like, I think I think Justin Brazo may have played himself into a into a a regular spot heading into next year. I think Johnny Beecher, Jesper Boquist is an RFA, so. I, I've liked what he's brought to the table. Some speed and skill in the bottom six. He's versatile. Do they bring him back? So I don't really know to her original question what the lines would be. There's too many. There's too many question marks about uh, who's staying, who's going, who's coming in to it's give really, line to me combinations. It's more about who's coming in, right? Like right. Think about last last off season. Who they they bring in? They. I mean. Morgan Geeky has been a big part of the team. They they bring in Geeky, they bring in Boquist, they bring in Van Riemsdyk, they bring in Shattenkirk. Like these are all guys that, if we had been trying to make the same predictions at this time last year, would not have been on our radar. Like it wouldn't have been something we could discuss really. But, and I th but I think there's significance, right? Because while it's tough to give line predictions when there's too many personnel question marks, there is significance to me in my opinion, feeling like Justin Brazo and Johnny Beecher have found themselves spots next year carved out coming into the opening night because that just makes it that much tougher because I also feel like it's a now or never situation for Fabian Lysel heading into next year's training camp. And he's, you know, battling injuries. And so is like, 
there's a lot that plays into it. Like, so I, I mean, Ge- Georgie Merkalov is going to be, you know, he turns 25 at some point now, or no, he's 23. So he turns 24 in October. So basically 24 for the start of next year. So mm. it's like, all right, like, is he, is he going to be red? You know, is he a legitimate NHL or is he mm. kind of, as he gets into his mid twenties, does he look more like a, you know, in baseball, they call him like a four a type player, like, really good in the AHL, but maybe doesn't quite stick in the NHL. So that that's another guy where you're like, all right, what is it? What is he? Like, is he, is he ready? Is he going to stick in the NHL or is he kind of bouncing back and forth again? Or does he have to go somewhere else? Um, and I guess some, just while we're here, and since you mentioned Lysel, I think it was Sam who also asked about um, whether there's any update on Lysel. And there really hasn't been. Uh, he's still out. I think Mark Diver tweeted last week at some point that uh, he was he was around the team around the Providence Bruins um, in a sling. So, you know, I, I guess we at least know it's an it's an arm injury. And yeah, I know initially there have been concerns that like it might be another concussion because of the way he hit the boards. Um, it doesn't seem like it's that. So, in that sense, just for like his head health that's encouraging but we have no idea if it's shoulder or arm or whatever it is like we just have no idea how long that recovery is going to be um as i said before like it it would suck for him if he has another off season that's going to be interrupted by injury that affects his training but you know you it, it is what it is like he's still going to be ready to go come training camp all right, so we don't have a lot of time. We're actually at the hour mark, and I do have something I have to do after this. I want to, if if you guys are cool with this, I want to end on this question from Tampa Tim. Okay. So this is an email that he sent us, um, and he had a few parts to it, but I'm interested in the last part. He says, P.S., Lightning fan base and talk radio are very confident they're going to get another cup. They aren't afraid of the Bruins at all. Uh, I'd love it if we could take them out first round. So basically giving us a little insight as to really what the narrative is down in Tampa, as we talked about the fact that Boston and Tampa aren't officially locked in, but that's the most likely matchup with only three se- three games less- left in the season for Boston. Um, Although, and- by the way, the, the Rangers lost again Thursday night. Mm-hmm. And Bruins are, Bruins are only, what, one point back of them or – couple points an hour or whatever. I think it's three, but um, three points, but they have a game in hand now. That's what it is. Yeah. So I just want to talk about it because I still, I can still really see this being a first round matchup, like Boston Tampa as a first round matchup. Cause we we've talked about it from the Bruins standpoint, right? Like Boston, how do they match up against Vasilevsky and, and Kucherov and, um, we've had a lot of commentary from Boston fans like, oh, you know, whether or not they think the Bruins can handle it. It sounds like uh, the fan base in Tampa is very confident that they can beat Boston. Yeah, I, I think I still feel like from prob- like all the other Eastern Conference contenders, I feel like their fan bases probably don't fear Boston. Like out of the teams near the top of the standings, most of them probably look at the Bruins as the most favorable matchup. And, you know, I think this Bruins team can use that, right? Like everyone's going to do playoff predictions. And if say ESPN puts theirs out and, you know, nine out of 10 are picking Tampa in that series, like use that as bulletin board material. I, mm-hmm. I've, I mentioned this like a little while ago, but if you can, you know, despite whatever your record is, like if you can adopt a, a, an underdog mentality and be like, hey, look, no one believes in us despite our record. Like, let's go prove all these idiots wrong. That, there's That's not a bad thing. Like, that's that's a good chip on your shoulder to have if if you can find a way to play that card. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, with good reason, I think Tampa Bay and their radio analysts should be uh, confident because they have a winning pedigree and they have as much high-end talent as Boston. Um, so... It's definitely, yeah, I guess let's wait and see. It'd be great to beat Tampa Bay. Um, Bridget, I know we have a hard out. Uh, so there's a couple we can just literally, like, in the next 60 seconds, just rattle through just to give people shout-outs for their participation. Um, Mark, uh, you listen to every episode, and we're 
um, thankful for your support. Uh, we talked, he talks about Watherspoon Peak staying together for the remainder of the regular season. We already kind of know that Shattenkirk's getting in, but we do think they'll be a playoff pair. Um, J- uh, Vince asked if by the way, we had, Qu- we had three different marks submit oh, questions. A new, wow. a, a new record for one name, I believe. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And only one Pumba, one Pumba. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, Vince asked if Jeremy Swayman's the right man for the Bruins or if he's overrated. Uh, I'm, I guess we'll find out, right? We'll, we, we'll ne- we might never know if um, they keep with the rotation, if he's the right man to be the only man. But I guess that's why the playoffs and the rotation, we'll see how that plays I, out. Yeah, I, I think he's I think he's only overrated if someone's trying to like already put him in the category of like a top three goal in the league. Like I, I don't think he's proven that yet. I think first half of the season, he was definitely playing like a top five goalie in the league. Um, I think at worst he's top 10, mm. but you know, so I, I guess it depends on like where someone's putting him. If someone says he's the second best goalie in the NHL, I'd be like, okay, yeah, that's overrating him. Um, yeah. If you think he's fifth yeah. or sixth best, I think that's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And we had a uh, Mark G, one of the other marks uh, asked about the Bruins power play. He says he's uh, uh yes. he's from Canada, I guess, Mark G. Uh, and he said, for me, McAvoy has to be willing to shoot more, and I would not have Martian on the half boards. Quick thoughts. Yes, on the McAvoy. Yep. Got to have yeah, a shot it, first mentality. It, like, lit- literally everyone in that power play unit other than David Pasenak has to be willing to shoot more. Um, that too many – like, all the rest of them defer too much, so – I will say, like when when you watch the Bruins in practice, they they shoot like guys take the shots. It's it's baffling how like they get to games and all of a sudden they don't want to do it. So, I, you know, watching Friday's practice. Listen, I'm not an expert, but I thought the po- the top I thought the top power play unit looked pretty good in practice. I thought they were moving the puck quickly. Guy bodies pucks were moving, guys were shooting. They were getting traffic to the net. If they can do that in the game, like they'll they'll be fine. They'll pull out of this, but it, it hasn't it hasn't translated yet. So, in the spirit of getting to all the marks, <laughs> Mark Ra- Rabon Rabon uh, on YouTube said he wants seven defensemen in the lineup for the playoffs. Play a forward short. Play an extra D. Um, I think his idea was that you'll you'll be able to maybe have an advantage in terms of matching D pairs against, um, you know, teams, teams lines. So he specifically brought up using Grizzly as like your seventh D, but literally like having him on the bench and, yeah. um, you know, playing with a short and forward group, which kind of wasn't really on our radar guys. Uh, this is something that you see much more often in college hockey and on a team that has um, injuries, right. Uh, that, that you're, you're trying to to find a way to optimize your lineup when you know you you're short either shorthanded or or what have you. Um, so quick thoughts and on that. John Cooper used it in Tampa Bay, so you know it's tough to say it doesn't work. I don't love the idea because I think it's important for all the guys that are in the lineup to kind of get their feet wet and spotting seven D. It's just I don't I don't love it, and I also think the Bruins' depth is one of their stronger suits. Uh, their bottom six oftentimes plays better than, I don't know. So I, with this Bruins team, I don't love the idea of it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and it's good timing. Jim Montgomery was actually asked about this Friday. Um, and he said like certain situations, it makes sense, but in his mind, it's not something you want to do every game um, or have to rely on consistently. And he, and he cited basically the same reasons. Like you, you want lines to have chemistry. You want to have, enough forwards because what what can happen with going with 11 forwards is you know we, we talk about like Montgomery changes his lines too much as it is well if you have 11 forwards you have to change your line so like you are naturally there's one position that's like constantly rotating through so whether it's different left wings or different right wings on different lines and then what also can happen is you decide things are too out of whack and now we're just not going to use two forwards. We're going to shorten the bench, which you can do in the third period of a game, but you don't want to be starting doing that like halfway through a playoff game. Like you're going to, you're going to get forwards too tired. So 
Um, in certain situations, it, it might make sense, but uh, I don't think it would be a regular thing. All right. I think we got through a good chunk. Uh, yeah, there's, we'll sign off. There's there's one more from Bruins 77. Are the Bruins top players, have they been overused? Will they run out of gas? You know, maybe trying to overcompensate for a lack of offense at the lineup. Pasta, Zaka, blah, blah, blah. Um, personally, guys, I, I think, you know, you have to – I don't think they're playing more than other teams' top players. It is what it is. Um, so I don't know if you guys have any different opinions, but – Xerxes yeah. does. I just heard him crying to come in. Yeah. I mean, David Pashnak, you know, he, he accounts for half the team's offense one way or the other a goal or assist. Like he got to play him. You're not where you are if he's not playing as much as he is. So, yeah, I mean, Pashnak's the only forward playing 20 minutes a game and he's right at 20. That, that shouldn't be too taxing for someone in his prime physically. If you wanted to pick one out, maybe Martian second, he's playing 19, 12 a game. He's played every game this season. Like, Maybe that's one where you'd say, uh, you know what, Martian at 35 years old, maybe you would have liked that number to be a little less, but I don't know. I mean, Martian's also a physical freak, and he's said he's felt healthy this season. So I don't have a huge problem with that. And everyone else is at like 1809 or, or lower, which should not be an issue. Would it be, would you guys rest a couple of players in the last game or two? Just is that something that they can do? I, I wouldn't mind it, um, yeah. and I especially wouldn't mind it if if Martian's one of them, just for that exact reason that he, you know, he he is older, and um, but you know, Martian doesn't want to do that. He right. he wants to play every game, especially being this cl- You know that that playing all eighty two games like that does mean something to guys. So when you're this close, you you want to finish that. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you to everybody who submitted questions on all all platforms that you did. We appreciate the listenership. We appreciate the interaction. Hopefully we, I think we got to everybody. Um, we had to rush some of the end, but better than not getting to you guys. So thank you all for, for listening. I'll hear Xerxes. Bridget's got Xerxes. He doesn't mm-hmm. look too thrilled, Bridget. So he might nope. be biting you again. <laughs> I was gonna, I was going to say he's going to, he's got a, He's going to celebrate episode 300 with a nice bite. Yep, that's yeah. what he usually does. I'm surprised he didn't. Thank you, Xerxes, for that. Um. <laughs> so uh, Saturday, we have Bruins-Penguins. Enjoy that. Enjoy the National Championship in College Hockey, BC versus Denver, if you're watching that. Have a great weekend, and we will talk to you guys on Monday. Hey, guys, thanks for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.